It's a beautiful morning, and God's house is full, and we're going to enjoy a fellowship meal afterwards, so this is a good Sunday. I'm going to ask if you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 12, and we're going to look at verses 18 through 29 this morning. Hebrews 12, 18 through 29, and once you have found that spot, then I would ask if you'd please stand in reverence for God's holy word. And I will ask for your response once the reading is complete. Hebrews 12, 18 through 29, and these are the inerrant words of God. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire, and may God bless the reading of His Word. And you may be seated. So this is the very last of four topical sermons uh, that outline theological, or in this case more of a practical, uh, distinction of this church. And at the outset, I want to give credit to a wonderful book that if you're interested in pursuing this topic further, that I would strongly recommend. It's called The Lord's Service by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Myers, where he outlines uh, in book form uh, what it is to worship in spirit and in truth and to have a well-thought-through liturgy. So early on in this series, I did mention that while the Reformation began as a question over how man is justified, that was the initial question at the Reformation, how is it that we are saved, that debate quickly turned into a debate about authority. What is our final authority? And of course, the Reformational side said sola scriptura, by scripture alone. Scripture is our sole final authority. And Rome's answer was that Rome's authority is a three-legged stool of the Pope, tradition, and Scripture. Of course, it is Scripture as interpreted by the church, tradition as declared by the church, and the Pope as selected by the church. So really, Rome's position uh, could be diluted down to sola ecclesia, by the church alone. So uh, Protestants say we are justified by faith alone, and our authority is Scripture alone, uh, and Rome essentially answers you are saved by the church alone, uh, and your final authority is the church alone. However, once the terms of debate became about what our final authority is, rather than uh, the very specific question of how man is justified, once you're at questions of ultimate authority, suddenly the entire world breaks open. Everything is up for debate once our final authority gets tested. There is a caricature, fair or unfair, that Reformed Christians are basically a 29-pound brain with legs to get us around, right? We're, we're just a brain, and, and all our body is is just a carrying case uh, to get our brain to where it needs to go. And then we go to church, and we get a, 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 a theological lecture, and, and information is just put in the briefcase, and then we walk back. But that basically we are merely minds. And of course, Reformed theology is deeply concerned about loving God with our mind, uh, and yet the heart of the Reformation went much deeper than just that. 
Worship was very much at the heart of the Reformation. What does a God-glorifying church service look like? How are we to worship God in spirit and in truth? And I mentioned also in this series uh, that in his own time, Calvin was known as the theologian of the Holy Spirit because of his strong emphasis on life in the Spirit uh, as well as on the worship of the church. And so the Reformation was really as much a Reformation of worship as it was in doctrine and in morals. Uh, And you see that come through in many of the Reformers. Luther said that music was the handmaiden of theology. Uh, And Luther himself was a a notable hymn writer. And one of his hymns has survived to this day. Uh, A mighty fortress is our God is Luther's work. And so whatever else we're going to say about worship, we must say this. Worship is at the center of human life. Worship is what we are made for. Worship is ground zero. It is, it is the source from which all of life, all the issues of life, stem from worship. And everybody on this planet is a worshiper. Everybody on this planet worships their God. Yes, it might be mammon. Yes, it might be some cheap thrill. It might be some... But every man, woman, and child on this earth worships because we're re, we were designed to worship. And everybody worships. And they are either worshiping the living God of Scripture or they are worshiping some form of idol that must be smashed. But everybody is a worshiper, and we want to be worshipers of the true and living God. And so we approach Him with the appropriate reverence. Of course, we know that from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, we have moved from the seventh day Sabbath to the first day Lord's Day Sabbath because Christ was resurrected on the first day as a sign and as a seal of His new covenant. The the new creation is instituted when Christ comes out uh, and is mistaken as a gardener in the new creation. And so it is fitting that the church from the New Testament onward has celebrated the Lord's Day on the first day rather than on the seventh day. And we may frequently be confused about that because we have a two-day weekend in our conception, and the last day of that two-day weekend is Sunday, so we tend to think Monday is the first day of the week. But your calendar is correct. Sunday is the first day of the week. The Lord's Day is how we orient time because Jesus is the gardener of a new creation that has been instituted, and our day of worship acknowledges this new covenant reality. Worship flows out of the Sunday, out of the first day into the entire week. And we know, again, from reading our Bibles from start to finish, that God works with His people through covenants, through a series of covenants. And therefore, our worship is an act of covenant keeping. And here, this immediately reminds us of two ditches uh, that we may fall into on either side if we are not careful about what it means that worship is covenantal. One is that worship quickly becomes about us. Uh, And this ditch is prominent in our own culture. Worship is about me. Worship is about the experience I have on Sunday morning, right? Uh, if, If I get all the feels, if I get goosebumps, then worship happened. And if I don't, then it didn't. But one thing we know for certain, worship is about me. Okay, that's what we know for sure. Uh, And therefore, that introduces a whole host of emotional manipulative tactics that many uh, employ in order to make people feel like they worshipped in spirit and in truth, when in fact, they were just getting deeper into their idolatrous hearts. That is one ditch, is to make worship private, uh, to personalize it so much that it's a private, subjective experience, and it's an emotive experience primarily. On the other side of the road is a ditch that I don't think is particularly prominent today. It exists today, but there have been periods of history that have gone into this other ditch, which rightly sees that worship is objective. It's not about me, okay? And it's not about you. It's objective. It's about God as our fixed point, but that can turn into empty formalism, where people are just going through the motions and they're not thinking about what they are doing. We know that true biblical worship is both personal and objective. It's covenantal. And covenants apply to individual people, but they are objective. Uh, And so this orients what we are trying to accomplish in corporate worship. It is covenantal. It involves the individual, but it is also objective. And so while the contents of what we, work, or what we do in each Lord's Day is different, you'll notice that the structure of the service follows the same pattern every Lord's Day. And again, this immediately corrects an error that is very common in our day, 
uh, an error that has come down from uh, what C.S. Lewis called one of the most odious men in human history. Uh, Lewis called Jean-Jacques Rousseau vainer than Satan. Uh, and Rousseau is the one who let all of us know that authenticity is about your feelings. Okay? Authenticity is about how you feel. And so to be an authentic person, we must be spontaneous. We must express ourselves. And of course, Rousseau, for now, has won that debate in our conception. However, this is clearly not the case, that for sincerity to be real, it must be spontaneous. This view can cause us to make the error of thinking that preparation must mean we are some form of legalists. However, if you have ever watched the RCMP musical ride, and you see how glorious it is, or you, you see the snowbirds, the snowbirds fly in formation, do you, are you left thinking, boy, what a bunch of legalists? I hope not. What you ought to think is, boy, are those people so sincere that they are dedicated to excellence. Okay? That is a biblical conception of sincerity, unlike the, well, I'm just going to get deeper into my idolatrous, filthy heart, Rousseauian, enlightenment type of view of authenticity. What you're seeing when you watch a military formation, when you watch worship done in spirit and in truth, what you're watching is a sincerity that is so genuine that it is committed to excellence. The Bible actually loves repetition, and nowhere does it warn us against repetition. The only warning that the Bible gives is against vain repetition. But the Bible loves repetition, and St. Paul even says that in some of his letters, that it's not hard for me to repeat myself. In fact, you people seem to need repetition, so here I go again, writing another letter, okay? because we need repetition. And repetition is good. It's how you learned your alphabet. The reason I know the Lord's Prayer by heart is because I said it every morning from kindergarten through to grade 12. Repetition got the contents into me. So that now as an adult, I can, it's so there that I can think about the element of the Lord's Prayer and I can personalize it. One brother in this church told me that one of the reasons he wants to raise his children here is because every Lord's Day his children are going to hear the words that these are the inerrant words of God when Scripture is read. Further, if your child is accustomed to 15 years of standing up in reverence for God's Word... No matter where they go in life, do you not think that that muscle memory will help them to remember when God's Word is read, something serious is happening? When God's Word is read, we're like those people in Nehemiah 8 that stood up in reverence when God's Word is read. Okay? It will go with us. Muscle memory is a thing. Our bodies need to be involved in worship. The whole person must be involved in worship. This isn't just a brain dump. The whole man, the whole woman is involved in covenant worship worship. So what we desire each Lord's Day morning is for our worship to be both glad and solemn. These are both important. This is serious business, but that doesn't mean it's a funeral, okay? A church service is not God's funeral. It's a joyous occasion, but it's a heavy joy. It's not a, it's not a junior high pep rally. That's not what Sunday morning is for, okay? It is joyous and serious both. And so when we do things that can turn into vain repetition if we're not mindful. When we uh, do a responsive reading of the catechism, for example, or when we respond, praise be to God, after the scripture reading, this isn't just something to do for no reason and we're just checking our brains out and we're just doing it. Rather, it's an acknowledgement of what we read in Hebrews this morning. God has called us to his holy mountain. God would have been perfectly just to leave us out to die and starve to death slowly in the wilderness. He has called us to his holy mountain, and he has fed us with his word. Is it not fitting that we respond verbally back to him, to give him thanks? Lord, you did not leave us out in the desert like we deserved. You are feeding us by your word. You're instructing us by your word. Praise be to God. Okay? That must be a thoughtful thing in our mind. Anytime the congregation responds including when we read a catechism question or a creed, we are, we're in dialogue with God, which is a large degree of what worship is. God never speaks more directly than when his word is read line by line, which is why we do scripture reading. And the reason we have standing and response and so forth is because we are conversing with the living God. He has summoned us together and we enter into conversation with him each Lord's Day morning. 
So you are not just a spectator watching the religious professionals up front wearing their proper robes and swinging the incense properly and doing all the things and, and it's enough that you just observe it and then you can go home as though nothing happened and you don't understand any of it. That's wrong. Okay? You are not observing religious professionals. You are here. You are here. God called you here this morning and the whole you must be involved in covenant worship. Your mind, your emotions, your body, the whole thing is here to enter into covenant renewal with the Lord God. In Genesis chapter 2, at the beginning of creation, we have a treasure map that is painted of the garden. And in that garden, before the fall, God meets with His people. And you'll notice the way that the Bible describes that first garden sanctuary is it's raised, right? Rivers flow out of it. Rivers flow out. This is a raised sanctuary, and those rivers flowing in different directions cover, they go out to the corners of the earth. Living water flows from the sanctuary out into the world. And what happens in the sanctuary flows down to all of creation. What happens in the sanctuary is at the top. The rest of life flows down from that sanctuary garden. Ezekiel sees a temple picture that I think is the same reality. He sees this raised temple up and there's this trickle of water coming out and then there's, it's knee deep and then it's such a torrent of water coming out of this uh, temple that no one dare swim across it of living water. Well, how does the Bible define living water? This is the Holy Spirit. This is the same thing that was happening in the garden. A raised sanctuary with the issues of life coming out. The spirit of living water flowing down from God's sanctuary. And the Bible closes in Revelation with another picture of a river flowing out of another garden sanctuary. A river that is bringing healing to the nations. So what we do in God's sanctuary each Lord's Day morning very literally impacts the entire world. And I think we fail to see that. We have moved into this view of pietism, that, that, that the spiritual life is this, just this inward thing rather than an outward-facing reality that's objective for all creation. But what happens in the church on Sunday morning literally dictates the way that the world is going to go. Herman Melville, the author of the great classic Moby Dick, says this. It's in Old English, but follow closely. The pulpit is ever the earth's foremost part. All the rest comes in its rear. The pulpit leads the world. From thence, the storm of God's quick wrath is first decried, and the bow must bear the earliest brunt. From thence, it is the God of breezes, fair or foul, is first invoked for favorable winds. Yes, the world is a ship on its passage out, and not a voyage complete, and the pulpit is its prow. See what Melville is saying? The world is this great ship, and what is commandeering the ship is the pulpit. And I believe Melville is correct. We have lost a, a sense of the potency of Lord's Day worship, but Melville is absolutely correct. And if I thought Melville was wrong, I would not be wasting my time doing this. I don't think it is a waste of time. And I hope you don't either, because Melville is correct. As goes the church, so goes the world. If you want to see, if you want to understand the world today, go back 50 years ago and see what was happening on Sunday morning. You will get a good picture for the state of affairs today because of what the pulpit and the church as a whole was doing back then. The state of affairs in the world is, to a large degree, a commentary on the pulpit of the generation before. And so I want to ask us this morning, if we're thinking, looking forward and looking back and the, the downstream consequences of what we do in the Lord's house, I want to ask this question. Has the pulpit, and is the pulpit today, leading the world into greater reverence, into greater fear of God, okay? calling out God's fierce judgment and offering His overwhelming and amazing grace? Or are we teaching the world that God is to be trifled with? Are we teaching the world that God is just a, a, a sky fairy, a vending machine? You, 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 know, you follow this formula and then God's just going to make your life happy? Okay. Where we are today is a picture of what worship was like 50 years ago. And what we do now is a picture of what is going to look like for our grandchildren. We need to think this through. In our text this morning, in verses 18 through 21... 
we read this. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages may be spoken to them. Think about that. That is the uniform testimony of God's people. When, God's, when God speaks, they say, please make it stop. It's not warm. It's not breezy. It's not chatty. It's not informal. Okay? It's not a cute conversation of you and Jesus bumping into each other while you're doing your makeup. It's fierce. <laughs> please make it stop is what God's people say when God speaks to them. It's terrifying. It's intimidating. It's ferocious. Make it stop. Verse 20, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. This is a terrifying theme, and it reminds us of the dread and the fear that even Moses himself had when God spoke to him, and the many layers of covering that Moses needed to even approach the people, and they hurt because of God's glory. And yet, it remains common in our picture of things to see the God of the Old Testament as fierce and powerful and majestic and holy, and He filled people's hearts with dread. But now, we're in the New Covenant. Now, we're in the New Testament. God got on His meds. God chilled out. God doesn't really care anymore. God's casual, right? He gets us, as one popular advertising campaign said. And this approach can and has led to a casual and careless approach to the worship of the living God, as though we can just walk up to God on our own terms in a flippant or irreverent manner. And I would suggest that far too many people in our society feel perfectly comfortable rolling out of bed and approaching the mountain of God on three hours of sleep, distracted and still wearing their Cookie Monster pajama pants. Is that what God wants? Would you meet the King of England that way? Would you? Would you even go to a municipal council meeting that way? Of course not. Does the living God not deserve that and more? What you would give your municipal counselor? This is serious business. Okay? And of course we accept people as they come. But as they get to know the living God, it ought to fill their heart with a reverence that they want to approach God on His terms. And to be prepared, that's why we put each week's sermon text in the bulletin the week before so you can start working on it. You can start reading it. You can start wrestling with the Holy Spirit and say, open my eyes. What's there? What's all there? Okay? And to, to, to lay the little kids' clothes out Saturday night so it's not a zoo on Sunday morning to get here. This ought to be a priority. We're, God has called His people together. We don't come half chaos okay, uh, and unplanned. This is something that needs to be planned for. If you can get your kids to hockey practice on time, if you can make it to school on time, if you can make it to work on time, you can make it to church on time. Okay? This is a priority, and we need to think through the worship of the living God. And if we have such an indifferent way about thinking about worship, it would be easy to look at the passage that we've looked at this morning and see that it was in fact true that at Sinai there was this fierce and powerful earthquake and there's an electrical storm and it was intimidating, it was fierce, it was powerful, it was potent, but they went to Sinai. And we're not going to Sinai anymore, Matt. We're going to Zion. It's all different. But look at what actually is said here. Let's read on in verses 23, or 22 through 29. It says, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of us all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking." For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God 
is a consuming fire. So what's being said here? Well, one is that when we gather for worship, we're actually in two places at once. I know you can't see it with your eyes, but if you look up with the eyes of the author of Hebrews, you'll see that there's a retractable roof here. We're in two positions at once. We are in the RM of Reshot, yes. But you know where else we are? In the heavenly places. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. We are lifted up spiritually to heaven when we gather for worship like this. We are approaching the Zion of God. We are in the city of God, and yet we're right here. We are in two places at once when the church gathers for potent worship. The Lord's Day Sabbath worship is, of course, a taste of the eternal Sabbath, when there is no more difficulty, when we enter eternal rest, when heaven and earth are completely and fully reunited. And that day is coming. We sang that this morning. God will dwell again with us. The new Jerusalem is coming down. Heaven and earth will be reunited in such a way that it is better and more permanent than what our first parents enjoyed before the fall. See? So when we're done worshiping, this retractable roof closes again and we go back out into the world. But one day that roof is going to stay open because heaven and earth are joined forever. At Mount Zion, in the New Covenant, we have the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem where innumerable angels are gathered for a feast, verse 22. We encounter the judge of all, verse 23, and Christ is this mediator of a superior covenant, verse 24. And note this, the warnings from heaven are more dire than they were previously, verse 25. See, when God thundered at Sinai, it was confined to a little tiny geographic sliver in Canaan. God made a mountain tremble. What does it say now? Heaven and earth are shaking. Now, this got intensified. This got bigger, not smaller. Heaven is shaking. Earth is shaking. Not just one little mountain in a tiny sliver of geography. Heaven and earth are shaking. Until such a time that only that which cannot be shaken remains, which is, of course, the kingdom of God. So how? How did it enter? And I just want to stop for a minute. Think about this. We can't examine one another's hearts, so this isn't for your neighbor. This is for you, and this is for me. How did we come to treat Lord's Day worship like a light thing? How did that happen? How many bad theological steps had to happen to treat Sunday morning like it's just optional? Maybe I'll go. Maybe, yeah. maybe I won't pay attention. Maybe I won't participate. Maybe the kids of the church will never hear what it's like for men to sing in masculine voices. How did we get there? What a wrong view of God that would treat worship on the Lord's day, on the day of his resurrection, when he signaled that he is making a new creation. How did we get to treat this like a light or trivial thing? When God calls his people together, he means serious business. This is one of the reasons that what happened several years ago with so-called online church, such an absolute tragedy. God calls his people together. That means your body has to show up. Okay? This isn't just a brain dump. This isn't just transferring information from the minister's mind to somebody else's mind as though the body and the soul and the person don't matter. Worship is embodied. It's personal. There's living, breathing image bearers relating one to the other. When Moses was called, God shook a singular mountain. And in this greater covenant, God is shaking the entire cosmos. Moses, going up to Sinai, was a type and a shadow of this greater reality in which we now live. And so the new covenant is even more sober. Christ is speaking directly from heaven, and it is shaking everything. And he will continue to shake until all the chaff has been blown away. And that's what world history is, is a shaking until the chaff is gone. And all that remains is the good fruit. All that remains is the actual wheat. Verse 27. In his book on worship, Primer on Worship and Reformation, Douglas Wilson writes that Jesus promised us that the gates of Hades would not prevail against the church. And it is not often noted that the gates of Hades are not an offensive weapon. Hades is being besieged by the church. It is not the other way around. And so we need to learn to see that biblical worship of God is a powerful battering ram. And each Lord's Day, we have the privilege of taking another swing. That's what it is. The enemies of God hear us every Sunday morning. 
Oh, those people, they're not a threat, right? And then seven days later, we're back again. Boom. Boom. Okay. And one day, those gates swing open, and it's everyone's job to rush in there. It's everyone's job to climb over the siege ladders. It's everyone's job to advance the kingdom of God. And worship, corporate worship, is the center of God's purposes for his kingdom on earth. Shania shared about Scotland this morning. John Knox was sure a guy who was easy to not take seriously for the first several years, okay? Until he was more powerful than all the armies of Europe. Not because of mere force, but because everybody knew John Knox is a majority. John Knox has God on his side, okay? John Knox uh, is far more imposing than all the assembled armies of Europe, said Queen Bloody Mary, okay? John Knox understood the importance of worship, of doctrine, of life, all aligning with one another. And so again, as goes the church, so goes the world. And this is why worship is an act of warfare. It's an act of warfare for the cosmos. It's part of the long war that God is waging as he puts his enemies under his feet and as he reestablishes the heavenly city on earth. God has been shaking things for 2,000 years and he will continue to do so until only one thing is remaining and that is that which cannot be shaken, his kingdom. And so to change the metaphors, another way of speaking of this is that God is a consuming fire. We all have to go through the gates. We all have to walk into the furnace. We all must go in. And some of us will be burnt and some of us will be purified. That's what worship does. It sorts. The dross is burned off and destroyed, but the gold comes out purer than ever before. And that is the aim of new covenant worship. God is a jealous God, and He is jealous for holy worship and not for trivial worship. We are standing, as Moses was reminded, on holy ground. And so we know what happens when people get innovative and start to take license with the worship service. We all know about Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, who started to innovate. You know, Dad's old boring church service is getting pretty lame. Why don't we try this differently? Why don't we try it with strange fire? And we all know how God consumed Nadab and Abihu. We know the story of Uzzah trying to stabilize the ark, and God struck him dead. We read in Isaiah 2 how God shows his teeth when the people go through the motions of just living however they want to live and then just going through the motions on Sunday morning. They just showed up and they think that God likes that. And what does God say? I hate your solemn assemblies. I absolutely detest it. When you're living an ungodly life and then you become a hypocrite on Sunday morning and pretend like showing up was adequate. I know how you're living. I see what you do. Friday night. I see how you nag at your husband. I see how you treat your kids. Please don't worship that way. I hate your solemn assemblies. I detest it. It would be much better for you if you didn't even show up, says Isaiah 2. God wants the whole person to show up. Not just the body, not just the brain. The whole man, the whole woman must show up to renew covenant with God. And of course, we're all thinking, yeah, but those are Old Testament examples, right? What about Ananias and Sapphira? What about Paul writing to the Corinthians, explaining to them why some of them were getting sick and why some of them were dying? Why? Because they took the Lord's Supper lightly. They did not treat it like a serious thing. And so Paul says, that's why a bunch of you died. Here's the explanation. You're not taking worship seriously. You're treating it in a trivial manner. And so when God's people gather to worship Him, we ought to do what He says. And this is why the way that we worship matters. We want everything we do on a Sunday morning to be something that God has said in His Word that He wants to be there. Every element must be something that God says He wants, because after all, we're worshiping God. So He sets the boundaries out. And this uh, brings us to uh, an important principle in church history, and if you're a note-taker, you can write this down, is the normative principle of worship versus the regulative principle of worship. Well, what are those $6 words? The normative principle of worship basically says we can do anything on a Sunday morning as long as there's not an explicit command against it, okay? So, for instance, I could opt, instead of preaching a sermon, I could show up in my one-piece winged leotard and give you an interpretive dance instead. And you, and you will quickly notice that there's not a single Bible verse that says I can't do that. And we all know how goofy that would be, okay? We all know God wouldn't take that seriously and neither would you. 
The normative principle of worship essentially says everything goes as long as it's not prohibited in Scripture. The regulative principle says, okay, this service is for God. So if we're rendering service to God, it can only include those things which God has said He wants. Okay? And how do we know what God wants? Well, it's in His Word. And we see as God deals covenantally with His people, He gives them signs and seals. Okay? And these are on God's terms. So we ought not to get innovative. We don't take a unlimited creative license. And we also don't stack tradition upon tradition, never explaining it so nobody knows what we're doing and suddenly you have a bunch of worshipers who have no idea why we do what we do. That's also why we print the rationale for covenant renewal format in the bulletin every week so that when your children say, Daddy, what do these stones mean? Uh, you've actually got an answer. Okay? But God always gives signs. Noah got a rainbow. Abram got circumcision. Moses got a Passover feast. And in the Christian church, we have baptism and the Lord's Supper. And we mark many other things, even outside of Scripture, with, uh, with markers that give us a, a sense of time and of space. We have memorials, like Easter eggs or Christmas trees or birthday candles or headstones in the cemetery, and they're all designed to give us a sense of place and of purpose and of time. And this is good. We need these memorials. They orient us. And so when God gives a rainbow so that he can uh, remember it, and it says that he put his bow in the sky so he remembers. Okay, well, is God going to forget if he doesn't see the rainbow? Of course not. But he puts it there anyway as an objective sign so all creation remembers. It's not that God's remembering is dependent on him, you know, this is not like God setting the alarm clock so he remembers because he was so absent-minded. This is God putting it there because that's the way he orders creation. Objective signs that point to a cosmic reality. And so when we talk about covenant renewal, we are not suggesting that God's covenant is like a lease that runs out every Saturday night. Right? Every Saturday night, God's lease with His people runs out and, and we better renew it so we can live with God again. It's not that. Okay? You don't die every morning after breakfast and then get resurrected when you eat lunch. It's, it's not a renewal like that. It's a renewal of just staying in fellowship, of being refreshed, being restored. Okay? A married couple uh, doesn't get divorced every time dad leaves for work in the morning and then they have to get remarried when he comes home. Okay? It's not that. This isn't a lease running out. This is a communion to keep us in close contact with God. That's what we mean by covenant renewal. So we're not suggesting that justified people can lose their salvation or that the church is kicked out every week and needs to get back in every week, but rather that justified people need to regularly draw close to God in order to be fed and to remain healthy and strong. And we have such a, cutting, a covenant cutting ceremony on Sinai in verses 18 through 21. And you'll notice, actually, when, God, uh, when Moses goes up to Sinai, it's almost like a wedding feast. And Moses is officiating, okay? And, and, and God says, yeah, I want that woman. And Moses looks at the people. You good with this? <laughs> yep, yeah, we're going to do everything. We're going to do everything, right? And he looks at God, you, you, you sure you want that? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm committed to getting that. And so it's like Moses is officiating a wedding at Sinai between God and his people. And this covenant ceremony ends with a feast in Exodus 24. And so these covenant patterns are the blueprint for covenant renewal worship. At Sinai, we have a call to worship, God calling his people to himself, Exodus 19, 1 through 9. And when these people draw close to God, they realize how unholy they are, and so there must be a cleansing and a confession of sin. You've got to wipe your feet before you come into the house. And so we see that confession of sin in Exodus 19, 10 through 25. And then there's this consecration, and this is where God instructs and gives his law and then explains. And we see that in chapters 20 through 23, where the law is given, and then it's explained for the people. And that correlates, of course, to our scripture reading and sermon. And then this all closes with a feast, with a benediction, a good meal, a, a communion service, if you will, and then a commissioning as God sends his people back into the world, Exodus 24. And so likewise, the call to worship and the commissioning are obvious bookends to covenant renewal. The, the service has to start somewhere and it has to end somewhere. God calls his people in, says, okay, come, it's time, it's come. Okay, so we, we come out of the world into the sanctuary, and then at the end, of course, it makes sense that he sends us out of the sanctuary back into the world. So these are the obvious bookends. And he wants to do so in a way that leaves us well-fed. 
and that is why communion goes towards the end on those Sundays that we have it. And he sends us out with a blessing. God always sends his people out with a blessing, which is why the very last thing that we do before sending people out is the benediction, the good word. God gives us a blessing as we go. And in between those two bookends, in between the call to worship and the commissioning, we have a confession, consecration, and communion. And again, that correlates strongly with what God does in the Old Testament. In the Old Covenant, when the three major sacrifices were offered together, they follow a specific pattern. You can read about that in Leviticus 9 or 2 Chronicles 29. When the, there's, there's three different types of offerings that are offered in the Old Testament, and when they happen together, they happen in this order. The guilt or the sin offering comes first, which correlates to our confession of sin, Leviticus 17. This is the cleansing, so we can enter conversation with God. And then the ascension offering, or the whole burnt offering, Leviticus 16, uh, and this correlates to our scripture reading and our sermon. Okay? And in the ascension offering, in the whole burnt offering, God said, burn everything. Make sure all the fat drippings are burnt. Make sure the liver is burnt. Make sure everything is burnt. And that's what God's word essentially does when it's preached. It tears us all apart. It leaves nothing unexamined. God's word is like a two-edged sword, it says. It tears us apart, makes sure everything gets burnt. Okay? This is the ascension offering. And then finally, God feeds us with a peace offering. And in the Old Testament, the peace offering was the only offering in which God ate in the presence of his people, or when he fed the worshipers, I should rather say, in the presence of God. And you see that in Deuteronomy 12. And these sacrifices were covenant renewals. Psalm 50, verses 3 to 6 says, Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by my sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Jesus, of course, is the last blood sacrifice that gets offered, and so that system is terminated in him. But the sacrifices of a different nature remain today. Romans 12.1 says that we today are living sacrifices. And when we offer our bodies, that is our spiritual worship. See, again, the strong correlation between the physical body and the spiritual core of man. The whole person comes. And so when you see your five C's in the bulletin, the call to worship, the confession, the consecration, communion, and commissioning, these are like shelves in the worship service. They're put there intentionally uh, as a desire to mimic the, the covenant renewal that God makes with his people all through redemptive history. And then we take these other elements that we know from Scripture that God wants, prayer, music, uh, scripture reading, so forth, and we put them on those shelves, and of course each week it's different, the scripture we're looking at, the songs we sing, and so forth, but the shelves remain the same, okay? The structure remains the same, and there's a logical order to it. It would seem odd to eat a meal and then have mom tell everyone, well, you actually need to go wash your hands, okay? You do that before the meal, okay? It would seem odd to confess our sins after we've taken the Lord's Supper. It would seem odd to start the service with the parting benediction, Okay, there's a logical order where, where these things go. And, and the desire is to have that be orderly and thought through. This isn't like some, you know, you've got a junk drawer. Does everyone have a junk drawer in their house? Right? And there's all these random elements, and we'll just kind of throw them where, ah, here's an X-Acto knife, and yeah, I haven't seen that set of pliers in years, and let's just kind of throw it all together and see what happens. The covenant renewal is a, is a desire to put some order, some logical order, so that even the rhythm of the service, apart from the content, but the rhythm teaches us about God's dealing with his people. And so in terms of application, I want to make one application to our family worship. Again, if we're looking at the patterns of the Old Covenant, we have morning and evening sacrifices, continual sacrifices. A lamb is offered in the morning, and it it smolders all day until evening time, and then dad gets home from the field, and then they put another lamb on to to smolder from night till morning, okay? Morning and evening. Uh, And this is a, a proper way to think through our prayers and our devotional time and our scripture reading. We're commanded in the New Testament to pray without ceasing. That incense needs to keep going up continually. We start and end each day before the Lord, mindful of the Lord, when we start the day and when we close the day. And we ought to be in the Word and prayer with our families. And the best times to do this are at breakfast and at bedtime. This is a logical order. In our own family, morning was best when the kids were small. I was in from the barn in time, and I made sure I was in from the barn on time. So we could do devotions, and as they've gotten older and schedules get more complex, we found that supper works better, and you will have to find what works best in your family. And there is some liberty in how to do this. And I'd encourage you, especially in the little years, keep it simple. 
Okay? Don't make it burdensome. There's a strange law in the Bible that says that you shouldn't boil a kid in its mother's milk. And everyone looks at that and says, that's weird, right? Because we don't eat that way anymore. Uh, I think that's typologically talking about Jesus being boiled in Jerusalem. But I think it also means uh, when, when your kids see dad go get the Bible or the hymnal, it shouldn't be dread and fear that takes over, <laughs> okay? Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. What's the principle there? Don't use something which is made for life to create death. If it's meant for life, then it's meant for life. So especially when kids are small, just keep it simple. Maybe it's two minutes, maybe it's a quick Bible story, and all you got out of your kids was that somebody said the word donkey. Great, wonderful, we're done. <laughs> okay, <laughs> on our way. It, it's more important that, that it happens than that it's particularly complex. So in the younger years, a quick Bible story is adequate. And with teenagers, as in our house, it only st- still takes a few minutes to read the scripture passage, do the table talk devotional, go around the table, everybody says something that they learned or a question or something that they were reminded of, and that takes minutes. Keep it brief, keep it simple, don't make it burdensome, just make sure that there's a discipline that happens. Because I'll also say this, isn't it a little bit cruel and arbitrary if kids never learn how to sit still at home, and then we expect them to sit for an hour and a half in church? That's a little unfair, right? This discipline starts in little steps at home. And so regularity is far more important than complexity. Make worship as a family a blessing rather than a burden for your children. Because family worship is practice for Lord's Day worship. And in all of this, we need to remember who we are as a church and why we come together to worship, to renew covenant with our husband, with God. The church is the bride of Christ. And the bride submits to her husband in all things. So we are to submit to the Lord in all things. And he is a perfect husband. He will never ask something something of us that is unjust or unfair or wicked like an earthly husband might. So we must trust the Lord in all things. And our worship must be according to his pleasure as stated in Scripture and not something that is at our creative whims. Just like marriage, we don't approach worship as something that we just make up as we go along and it's just unthoughtful. Rather, we see that God's covenant sets the terms for us. And so we are responders in worship. We are not inventors. We're not innovators. We are responders in worship. And again, that's why I want to challenge all of us. Come as a whole person. Okay? Come with your mind. Come with your heart. Come with your body. Come with your fingertips. The whole person needs to come before the living God to be fed. God has called us to his holy mountain. And we ought to do so thoughtfully with joy and with solemnness, both. Let's close. Lord God, we want to thank you for your incredible transcendence, for your holiness, for the awe with which you fill the creation. Lord, you are not a trivial God. You are not a light God. You are not somebody to be trifled with. You mean business, and you mean business with the mission that you give your church and your people on earth. Lord, and I pray that as we consider our own hearts, I pray uh, that we would avoid the ditches of triviality and uh, inward-focused emotivism. And I also pray that you would guard us from the opposite ditch of empty formalism, just watching religious professionals go through the motions and, uh, and having our hearts remain stiffened to you, being distracted, being unthoughtful, and with the intent of going back out and living an ungodly life the rest of the week. Lord, keep us from both ditches. And I pray for each one here. Lord, I pray uh, that we would see, both in your word and also experientially, what it means to approach you in spirit and in truth. What it means to have a joy that is also solemn, that is serious, a glory that is heavy. Lord, keep us from both ditches. And I pray that Trinity Fellowship would be a worshiping community that takes our worship seriously, joyfully, that our hearts would be glad that you have called us together You did not leave us out in the wilderness to die, Lord, but you call us together, you feed us, you refresh us, you renew covenant with us, you pardon us for our sins, you fill us, and then you send us back to our stations. And Lord, I pray that we would be faithful stewards at our stations in the week and at our station in worship each Lord's Day when you call us together as your people. Lord, I also want to pray for our fellowship meal that we'll enjoy, which is also a wonderful expression uh, of what it means for your worshipers to eat in your presence. Lord, I pray that, uh, that our time would be filled with laughter and storytelling uh, and honest uh, conversation and tears if need be. Lord, I pray that you would refresh us and feed us in that way. 
as well. Lord, that there would be genuine fellowship, genuine love for the people of your kingdom. Feed us, Lord, physically and spiritually. We leave this all in your kind and fatherly hands. Thank you that you have not left us in the dark. We pray this all in the strong name of Jesus, and amen. Please stand to sing. I found a treasure that can't be taken. I found a well that won't run dry. Oh, worldly pleasure be now forsaken. Behold what love, what life is mine. Good endless striving. Now make me righteous, put all my works, now grant me hope. Oh, hallelujah, the blood of Jesus, my only plea, my only boast. Christ is
The worship of the living God is a long war for the cosmos. Every Lord's Day morning, the future of the world is being determined by how God's people approach the heavenly city. God continues to shake the earth until His kingdom is all that remains. Every Lord's Day, we participate in this shaking by besieging the gates of Hades in song, prayer, and the preaching of God's Word. This is a joyful yet solemn task, and our worship is to be both alive and disciplined. Our hearts and heads must both be engaged in an intentional manner that refuses to treat the Lord's service like a drunk jar filled with random elements. Rather, it is to faithfully reflect the patterns and rhythms found all through the Scriptures whenever God keeps covenant with His people. So the charge is this. See to it that you are intentional about the worship of the living God in the daily pattern of family worship and in the calendar-defining event of corporate Sunday worship. And I'll leave you with the benediction from Numbers 6. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you.